Go ahead. Hi, I'm Chris Clifton, and I'm here to give the first serious security seminar of the of this semester, uh, spring 2009. And what I'm going to talk about today is uh, some joint work done with a recent graduate, uh, Erjan Nergiz finished his PhD in December, and Maurizio Azzori, who is at the University of Pisa, K, uh, KD Lab in Italy. And what I'm going to be talking about is privacy, and in particular, how do we measure privacy? Uh, you know, what is privacy? Well, the ability to access and control one's personal information is a commonly used definition. Uh, privacy rights are recognized by several treaties protected by law. Many of you have heard of HIPAA, uh, the U.S. Healthcare Information Portability and Accountability Act. People often think that P is for privacy. Uh, uh, privacy comes into it, but that's not actually what it's about. Uh, European Community Directive 9546 and various others set standards for privacy legislation in the European Union. Uh, there are uh, nations such as Australia that have cabinet level positions of privacy commissioner. So one key thing is that privacy is about individually identifiable data. The privacy is concerned with data that is about you and that can be traced to you. But what does that mean? What does it mean for data to be individually identifiable, to be something that can be traced to you? Well, there's a lot of definitions and approaches to protecting privacy. Uh, obfuscation. We alter data in ways or, or add noise to data so, well, it's private because it's not the real data anymore. Uh, anonymity removing that identity from the, from the data. Uh, the key is, how do we measure these things? How do we measure, is, you know, have we sufficiently obscured the sensitive information or suffic sufficiently anonymized the data? Talk about some of the issues involved in this. So I'm first going to go through, you know, what are the approaches? What are the approaches to measuring this? What are some of the issues? And then I'm going to talk about our new work in risk-based privacy. So some terminology first. Private data, we talk about individually identifiable data, but we also will often talk about sensitive data. Why is this? Well, there may be things that are individually identifiable that are not viewed as sensitive. So for example, if you go to the Purdue directory, it's very easy to look up certain information about any student. That is individually identifiable data, but it's not viewed as sensitive. There are other things like your grades that even I as a faculty member can't get my hands on. Uh, that is sensitive. Parties involved. You know, people talk about the data subject. That's who the data is about. Uh, it, with most privacy issues, unfortunately, the person who the data is about is not who actually controls the data or you know, physically controls the data. So there is a processor that is handling the data. A recipient of the data that is, is, this data is disclosed to, and an adversary who would misuse the data. And often these parties, you know, the recipient of a data may in fact be a potential adversary who would use the data in ways that, that you as the subject would prefer they don't. And the goal of technologies to preserve privacy is to try to prevent that disclosure at a level where the data can be misused. So what does obfuscation do? Well, the idea is to protect sensitive data uh, by ensuring that the recipient of the data doesn't actually see the sensitive values. They see something modified from those sensitive values. Uh, so you add noise to the data. If I'm trying to compute the average age of the people in this room, and everyone gives me their age, plus or minus 
10 years, you know, randomly chosen some, some number plus or minus, you know, between plus and minus 10 to add to their age. Well, if I take the average, I'm probably going to come reasonably close. Uh, in a much larger room, I'd probably get something very close because that noise would disappear in the average. The average of that random is zero. The, and what I'm getting is the sum or the average of the ages plus the average of the randoms. But if I ask anybody's individual age, hey, it's somewhere plus or minus 10 from what I got, but I don't know what. Now, one of the issues is how to use this data. There are specialized techniques to do this. So, for example, in the SIGMOD 2000 conference, there was a paper, Privacy Preserving Data Mining, that discussed how to build decision trees, how to learn a decision tree from data to which noise had been added. It turns out that just simply learning it on the noisy data doesn't work too well. You can do a lot better. And the reason is because when learning a decision tree, you would need to know uh, gaps, you know, where, where there's gaps in the data. And those start to disappear. So, for example, if there's nobody in the room who's between uh, 25 and 35, in a decision tree, I might want to make that decision between the young people and the older people. But where that break is would disappear once I added the noise. So how do we measure privacy in something like this? Well, the following year, so people looked at Agarwal and Agarwal's paper, uh, or looked at Srikant and Agarwal's paper, and said their notion of privacy and how much privacy they're getting doesn't make a lot of sense. And they came out and said, we want something that is much more intuitively reasonable. So their intu intuition was, hey, if I take and add a number between 0 and 1, randomly selected between 0 and 1, versus adding a number between 0 and 2, the first is going to give me half as much privacy. So I want a measure that's going to capture that notion. Uh, and then the second, if I have a sequence of random variables con converging to something, the privacy measures should also converge to the same thing. Uh, we won't get into as much detail at that. So what they proposed as a metric was to use the entropy, or actually two to the entropy, as a measure for privacy. Well, it's interesting because entropy we can define for any source of that noise, not just uniform, but we, but it gives us a good metric where we can compare it. And in fact, if I do say I have a, a uniform random variable between 0 and 2, this metric says the amount of privacy I'm getting is 2. But if I have, say, a, a Gaussian distribution to my noise, I can, it, it gives me a way to compare that that's meaningful. So, yeah, as an example, if we add noise from these two distributions, it would, you know, it would come out the same. Intuitively, it, we're adding just as much noise to the data. We're providing just as much protection for privacy. Okay, so what are the issues in this? Well, how much is enough? Well, it depends on the adversary what they're trying to do with the data, on the sensitivity of that particular data, on the individual. Uh, if we had one person in this room who was 80 years old and everybody else was in their 20s, uh, you know, adding plus or minus 10 probably would seem like it's providing a lot of obfuscation of the ages to the people who are in their 20s. The person who's 80, well, you know, so you're 70 or 90, it doesn't seem that much different. Uh, also, there's a problem with correlated values. What happens if you have age and birthday?